Oi. Hi there, my name is Dave Keller. I'm the president and chief strategist at Sierra Alpha Research uh, based in Cleveland, Ohio. So I help financial advisors and institutional investors to make better decisions and uh, do that in a couple different ways, help them uh, maximize returns, manage risk, and bring more mindfulness and awareness to their uh, investment process. I also enjoy incorporating non-financial topics into financial topics, so I'm a student pilot, I'm a musician, and so a lot of the, the best ideas I think you can uh, bring as an investor are learning from other disciplines, learning from other activities. And I write a blog at marketmisbehavior.com. So I'm a student pilot. I've got about 80 some uh, hours in a Cessna 172R, which is a pretty classic training uh, airplane. And uh, from the moment I started uh, learning to fly, I would always chat with my flight instructor about the similarities between investing and flying um, because flying requires discipline. It requires taking the emotion out of it. You're often in very stressful situations and you have to be able to function in that environment. So the similarities to trading are hilariously uh, common. So one of the ways my flight instructor always used to coach me was to tell me to be ready. And what that means is anytime you were flying an airplane, you always had to have an emergency plan in your mind, right, in place. So, you know, a lot of uh, the flying process is done when you're still on the ground and it's figuring out where you're going to go, registering a flight plan. And part of that is all along the way, if I'm flying from point A to point B, where are all the opportunities where I could have an exit plan? What are airports that I might go to? So, you know, I might look for an abandoned, abandoned airstrip, which in an emergency, I could probably get there. Or, you know, as you're flying around, you're always looking around, there's a golf course, there's a highway with no power lines. You know, you're always thinking, if something would happen right now, you know, what, what do you do? Uh, and the worst time that I, that I uh, or the worst experience of mine learning that was, uh, when I first was starting to to learn about emergency preparedness, your flight instructor will often just yank the throttle out. So you're flying, you know, everything's fine, 6,000 feet, no problem. All of a sudden, the whole plane just goes, boom, and it just drops very quickly. And, uh, and he says, all right, you just lost your engine. What do you do? And of course, the first thing you do is you completely panic. <laughs> you lose it. And, you know, your, your, your heart starts beating. It, you know, jumps up here. There's this whole physical sensation of falling, which is uncomfortable. And you feel like the plane's not doing what you expect it to. And so the first thing you do, like, I mean, the thing's jumping around. It's windy. I'm flopping around. I'm trying to find some paper uh, checklist so I can go through. All right, we just lost the engine. What do I do? And I'm you know, slowly trying to pick all these things together. And I was a total mess at it. Um, and again, it was totally safe. The instructor was there to make sure it was fine. But it was the mo one of the most uncomfortable things I've done. Um, and then three months later, he does the same trick. He pulls the, the throttle out and goes, all right, you just lost your engine. What do you do? And of course, at this point, after doing a bunch of time, I'm like, oh, I get that, 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 And you just, you know, you just know what to do. You know, it's not a physical reaction anymore. You just know, yep, I lost my engine. This is what I do. I check this and this and this and this and this. And so what you learn is in a stressful situation and literally a physically stressful situation, which as a trader, when you experienced loss for the first time, is a very similar set of physical reactions, right? It's your heart beating more, it's uncomfortable, you start sweating, but you still have to make an emotionless decision or make a disciplined decision as a result. What do you do, right? I always coach my, uh, my clients to have a good exit strategy. When you put a position on, when you um, have a, uh, a game plan in mind, what set of scenarios would cause that to be wrong, right? What market movement or what movement in that specific position would tell you that that is incorrect? And then how, what will you do about it? And the reason why you do that ahead of time is because if you have a position and it drops 8%, let's say you have a trailing stop or you have a percent stop or you have something in mind, it's no longer a question. It's not a subjective decision. Oh, do I still want to hold on to that? Am I sure that that's still something that deserves to be in my portfolio? You've already said ahead of time, if X, Y, Z happens, I'm going to do this. And you just do it. Um, that allows us to not make an emotional reaction to what we're seeing. It allows us to make a more disciplined, uh, emotionless reaction to a set of, uh, a set of conditions that we've already uh, sort of anticipated. So I think where human investors can be very uh, effective is having the creativity to think about what are all the things that could happen wrong for my portfolio and what am I going to do about that and lay it out ahead of time. Words that I, I rarely hear investors mention that they should mention way more often than they do is I don't know or I'm not sure. And I think I'm not sure is the more painful of the two um, because uh, you know, because we, if we think we know something, we all of a sudden decide we absolutely know something. And 
if there's one thing that is absolutely true is we don't absolutely know anything about investments. <laughs> or we just don't. Um, everything is based on probabilities and, and never certainties. Um, the reason why we have so much trouble with that is because we are hardwired as humans to want to have certainty. We want to feel that experts know things that are unknowable. And we want to feel that there is an investment process which will be, uh, you know, uh, perfection and, and won't have any issues. But if you've traded or invested one day, you'll know that that's not the case, right? Things are always based on probabilities. And the best thing you can do is set yourself up for a probabilistic set of outcomes. It's never for what's definitely going to happen. The time recently when that really hit me was the first time I've, I've done better and better going on financial media on television and, and uh, online TV and, and things like that. But the very first time I did, uh, I went on and I sort of gave a very honest investment approach. I sort of said, I'm really not sure what's going to happen, but I could see this happening and I could see this happening. And if X happens, I would bet on this. And if Y happens, I would go on that. And, you know, it was fine. It was about a five, 10 minute interview. They're like, great. And on the way to the elevator, he said, you know, it'd be great if you could just be more certain about exactly what you're expecting. And I'm thinking to myself, okay. And I, and I got on the elevator. I'm thinking, well, that makes sense, but, I, but I'm not certain, and no one really is, but we need that certainty. So when I go on television and I have three minutes to pitch an investment thesis, you have to imply a certainty because you have a limited amount of time to drive home a sound by drive home a thesis. But if I'm really trying to manage a portfolio or coaching my clients to, uh, you know, to look at asset allocation, it's never based on certainties. You really don't know the answer. Uh, and I would say, uh, one of my one of my mentors uh, used to say, Mike Epstein, who was a legendary trader. He was based in New York and actually was, if you know, the CMT Association. He was the first one to connect the New York society with the Boston buy side technical analysts and kind of link and turn the CMT association into the global organization it is now. Uh, but Mike always used to say, them that know, know they know, and them that don't know, don't know they don't know. <laughs> and the problem is no one really knows everything about an investment approach. So in general, we have to accept the um, fallibility, the, the imperfection of financial analysis, and that's technical, fundamental, quantitative, any of those things have an imperfection built into them um, because we're never going to know what the future holds. And the way you address that or the way you get past your um, struggles to, uh, of, of uncertainty is to have a good game plan, know that it's going to be imperfect, and have a regular period where you review uh, what you're doing. So what I coach clients is, you know, once a month, once a quarter, once a year, you have a regular period where you go back and review your wins, your your losses, your best picks, your worst picks, your outperformers, your underperformers, and try to pick apart how your toolkit can improve and try to minimize the uncertainty, maximize having a higher probability outcome to what you're doing. So often in my discussions with clients, we're talking about keeping it simple. And I found as an industry and as investors, we love to make things more complex. Uh, and, and as an industry as a whole, we love complexity, right? We love to make things more complicated because it seems more rigorous, it seems more detailed, it seems more effective. When in reality, the more simple things are, the more consistent and the more uh, robust they tend to be in terms of the results of them. Uh, you know, I, in my former life, I used to work with a lot of the trading floors uh, here in New York. So I was at a trading floor uh, downtown, and I was working with the uh, currency traders on the FX desk. And so I spent time walking around, and, and my job at the time was, as a technical analyst, to walk around and make sure that, um, you know, just to see how people were using charts, see how people were visually analyzing their, their space, and then to help provide some guidance on how they could improve it. And I, I noticed one trader in particular had, you know, the cockpit of a ton of screens. And as I looked, there had to be 50 or 60 different technical indicators. I mean, he literally had every technical indicator I had used was on the screen at once, all across the screen. So I'm watching him for a couple minutes and I'm thinking, like, this is unbelievable. I can't, I can't believe how he's able to use all this. So I, you know, shook his hand, introduced myself, and I said, you know, I'm a technical analyst. You're, you know, using an amazing amount of information. Can you tell me, like, what's your secret? How do you, you know, how to use it? And he said, I have no idea what any of this stuff means. <laughs> I'm like, okay. And he said, but the head of the desk will walk by and go, wow, look at that guy. He's all over the markets, right? So if you want to impress people, if you want to make things look more complicated, you can do that. But I've never put a chart or an insight in front of a client that has more than a couple inputs at any time. Um, it's really important to keep it simple. And the more 
information you put on a chart, the more detail you try to include, the more it ends up clouding the issue. It doesn't clarify the issue, it ends up clouding it. So a lot of times coaching my clients, we work on simplifying, we work on simple inputs, um, you know, consistent inputs that will allow them to draw consistent conclusions. Otherwise, you open yourself up to all those behavioral biases, confirmation bias and others that end up just getting in the way of good returns. How do I keep it simple? I like to use a combination of trend following and mean reversion. And what I mean is, I like having part of my toolkit that's helping me understand where the trends are, defining trends, recognizing trends, and understanding when trends might be exhausted, when they might be a little long in the tooth. The other side of that is, is playing to mean reversion, which is understanding when things get overextended. So when has a market gone too far uh, too quickly and, and might be poised for a rebound? And in general, looking at equity markets primarily, um, you know, over longer term timeframes, you're better off being a trend follower. So it's better over six to 12 months to bet on what has been working and to underweight what has not been working. In general, that's what the data uh, proves out. But in the short term, if you're looking at a couple days to a couple weeks, you really should be betting on, betting on mean reversion, meaning you should identify those little peaks and valleys within those longer trends. So the sweet spot, I would think in terms of keeping it simple, is having an indicator or an approach that's gonna help you measure the long-term trend, and then having a separate part of your toolkit simplistically telling you when you might wanna revisit something because it might be overextended. And if you use the two of those in combination, Overall, you're gonna do pretty well. You won't, you won't hit everything, there's nothing perfect, but you will be on top of most things and you won't be caught off guard, which is what's most important. So it's funny, Tom Dorsey, who's a, a mentor of mine, a friend, uh, he started Dorsey Wright years ago. He's a pioneer in point and figure analysis, so does some, has done some exceptional work with, with that. Uh, he shared a story about when he was a uh, test pilot in the military and he was flying an airplane, uh, southern part of the United States and um, basically got disoriented. And that happens a lot as a, as a pilot, you're, you're trained to you know, figure out where you are geographically and you have to understand where you're positioned relative to everything else. Um, but it's very easy to get, you know, to, to lose place of where you're at because you're focusing on a bunch of other things. So he was basically, and, and it's so funny the way he described it, he was looking for the ocean so he'd be able to orient himself, okay, I know that's west and now I need to do this. So what happens is he's looking around and he'd made a bunch of turns and everything and all of a sudden he sees this body of water and he's like, well, that's got to be the ocean. That's strange. I wouldn't have thought it's over there, but that's fine. I should be able to turn left. The airport should be right there. And he was getting low on fuel, which, you know, 90 some percent of airplane accidents are running out of fuel before you get back to your airport. That's not the situation you want to be in. So he starts looking around and, and of course makes the turn and there's no airport and it's a bunch of fields. And he's thinking, okay, this is bad. So in the end, he just has to put the plane down in the, in the middle of the field. He had somehow flown over the border and ended up landing in the middle of nowhere in Mexico. <laughs> So the lesson to that story is, uh, you know, number one, it's to trust your instruments. And you have tools in front of you. And at some point between when he was in a good place with his flight plan and when he was in the wrong place, he forgot to pay attention to his instruments or he saw something and, and didn't believe what he saw. And that was the biggest, uh, you know, the biggest problem that he had. He, he you know, could have seen where he was using the instruments, but he saw a body of water and then said, no, nope, instruments are wrong, that's where I need to be. So as investors, it's so funny, um, we have that same situation where our instruments, our model or our inputs, our, uh, our investment approach is telling us one set of decisions we should make, but we convince ourselves to do otherwise. And more often than not, that's because of behavioral biases, right? So something like confirmation bias is probably one of the more common where you decide you're bullish. I see the market move up or you know, recently here in you know, the S&P 500 has dropped very quickly. That happens, okay, I'm bearish. And then instead of paying attention to your instruments, which might not be quite too bearish, you just pay attention to the news headline or the movement or your portfolio losing a lot of value very quickly. And all of a sudden you've gotten away from the discipline of your process. So the most important thing we can do as investors is to trust our instruments. That means our instruments have to be pretty good to start with. So you have to make sure you're very thoughtful about what inputs you're, you're using and how you're paying attention, how you're structuring your process. But then we have to actually follow through with what we're seeing. So when do we need to change our instruments? When do we need to upgrade our, our instrument panel? Um, this is actually very, uh, a very, very good uh, question. And I would say as pilots, it's funny, you know, I've learned how to fly so far using very traditional 
Uh, they call it, you know, using stick and rudder flying and using the dial. So this is the old school, you know, way to measure altitude and speed and all of that. But there are way better avionics nowadays that you can use, you know, GPS and you can use, you know, uh, modern avionics are actually really, really powerful. Even in a, in a relatively inexpensive airplane, you can have really good, uh, you know, uh, tools to help you understand where you're at. And what's happened is pilots over time have learned to integrate those tools into their process. So at some point, if you've learned the traditional way of flying, looking at these dials, but there's something better out there. There's a new tool that's gonna help you better understand where you're at or anticipate a change that needs to happen. You have to have a time to review that. So, you know, it's funny, as pilots, every year or two, you have to go up for a check ride where you have to sort of reestablish your expertise flying an airplane, and between those points, that's a time to try and upgrade your process if you, uh, if you can. And working with my clients, we, uh, we talk about that same uh, idea. With some regularity, usually for advisors, it's about once a, once a year, maybe at the end of the year, hopefully you have a week where you can you know, look back, see where you're at, look forward, and, and just assess where your practice is. That's a really good time to look at your dashboard, look at your toolkit. And the problem I find a lot of people do is they try to change their process in the middle of things, and you don't want to do that. You need to have a dashboard and then follow that for a while and gather data about how it's working and when it's not working. And when you have issues with it or when you have a new input that might be good, you put it on a list over here. And then when you go through regular review process at the end of the year or the end of the quarter, that's when you've earned the right to look at that list and see if there's something that deserves to be included. Uh, but that regular review process is really, really important to make sure we have the best tools in front of us at any point. So I'm often asked by uh, investors, by uh, institutional investors, you know, what are the common um, behavioral biases? What are the biases that they should be most aware of? And I, I would say the most important starting point to incorporating behavioral finance into your process is awareness, right? Having awareness of your own imperfections and seeing where behavioral biases are affecting your decisions. And my first answer to most of those is endowment bias or endowment effect. And if you're not familiar with that, it's essentially something that you own, something that is your own, you assign greater value to it because it's something that you own, right? So if you give me a Real Vision coffee mug and that's mine, that has greater value to me than it will to someone else because it's something that's now mine, right? I, I attribute greater value to it. Um, you know, Will Danoff, who's a, a portfolio manager at Fidelity Investments, who I, I worked with at, at times, you know, he al always said that we don't own stocks, we rent them. Now, by definition, you do own stocks. Don't get me wrong. You are a shareholder, and there's a responsibility there, of course. But the point was more don't treat your stocks as if you own them. Don't think of them as your possessions that you have trouble getting rid of. You're renting that position. You are renting the right to participate there, which means you need to be equally ready to part ways when it's the right time to do it, right? If you need to move somewhere else. What happens is we all of a sudden will hold stocks in our portfolio much longer than we should. So a position will go against us, but we'll hold on to it too long because it's Home Depot. And we've loved Home Depot. It's been such a good name for us. It's been such a good part of our, our, our good returns. So when it starts performing poorly, we still hold on to it longer than we should because we're, we're owning it. We're not renting it. So you need to think of your positions as renting them. So how do you try to disconnect your thinking from endowment bias. And there's three things I tend to coach people on. Um, number one uh, is to disorient yourself from what you're looking at. And, and again, if you're looking at charts, which is a big part of my process, you cover up the ticker. And the reason why you do that, again, if you've looked at enough charts, and, and sadly I think I have, you start to know just from the chart, you'll know what company it is. You'll know Microsoft and Amazon, the really liquid stuff, because you've looked at it so many years and you, you understand it. But you know, if you're less familiar, it's a very quick thing to just cover up the tickers or you know, using whatever charting platform you use, you know, cover up that, that information so that you're just analyzing the trend. And if you can't cover up the ticker, just don't think of it as a company, think of it as a series of data, and you wanna analyze it from a very emotionless point, right? So what's the trend? Uh, where are the opportunities? Where are the turning points? What's the exit strategy if you do, if you would own it? Um, and defining that based on the price movements, not based on the company that it is. So by covering up the ticker, you remove that connection to the company, and a lot of times that'll you know, minimize the endowment uh, effect. Second way you can do it is by inverting the chart. Um, now, uh, many people have said, you know, a stock uh, goes up in the stairs and goes down in the elevator, meaning stocks go up and down in different ways because over time people accumulate positions, but when people panic, they tend to dump everything. They don't slowly scale out of a losing position. So as a result, markets, you know, stocks tend to move up and then they'll come down a lot more quickly than they go up. So inverting it won't look 100% right if you're used to looking at charts, but the process of it, the idea of it is to disconnect yourself from the bias of the pattern and the trajectory of the stock and just look again at the data series 
on its own and see, based on this new inverted price series, based on the toolkit I'm using, is this more likely to go up or down? And then using that as the decision factor instead of thinking this is Home Depot, this is Cheesecake Factor, whatever the stock is, and then basing it on that. So the third uh, and maybe the most valuable is what I would call the new money exercise. So forget about the fact that you own the stock. Say if you had new money right now, let's say you had a new client, you had X amount of dollars to put it, would you allocate it to this stock right now today? And a lot of times what you'll find is it's a position that you hold, but if you would be asked, but I, would I put new money on it? You'll be like, well, no, I wouldn't put new money on it now. And it's like, well, hold on. If you wouldn't put new money on it, then why do you have your old money still there, right? Maybe you should revisit that. So unless you can answer, answer that question as, yes, I would put new money there, then you may want to rethink the, you know, whether it has a place in your portfolio. And it goes back to situational awareness. If that's not the right stock to own, there are a lot of other stocks you could own at any one point. So maybe there are opportunities elsewhere. So there are three things I think you can do to disconnect yourself from endowment bias, which I think is one of the more common ones. Um, the first is to uh, cover up the ticker, disconnect from the company, think of it just as a stock uh, price. The second is to invert the chart, which is to disconnect from the trends that you might be uh, seeing otherwise. And the third thing is called the new money exercise, which is to consider if you had new money today, would you put it into that name? And if you do those three things with an existing position, you might come to a different conclusion than if you did it uh, uh, otherwise. And I think that's a really important process. So it's funny, I think a lot of people have a love-hate relationship with financial media, um, financial television and, and other inputs. And you know, I've heard some people say, just turn things like that off, don't pay attention to it, just focus on your process. And I get the idea of it because what, what uh, you know, if you pay too much attention to the short-term fluctuations, it automatically guides you to more short-term thinking. So if you have a choice of always looking at financial media or never looking at it, Never looking at it's probably the better of the two, but I don't think either of those is the optimal answer. And I think it's all about thoughtfully using some of those inputs. What you don't wanna do is have movements in the market. And again, when I'm, when I'm thinking financial media, I'm thinking something like financial television. Again, it, it tends to be very graphically oriented. They'll tend to bring guests on that mirror what's happening today. Um, and you know, when I go on fin financial media, I'm always asked to talk about what's happening right now because that's what they wanna, wanna talk about. But as a result, you're very driven to the short-term fluctuations. And you will notice on, on financial television, the entire screen often will glow green or gr glow red, depending on what's happening with the equity markets. And that'll start to bias your, your thinking. So, you know, what do you actually do? I think a thoughtful way to use financial media is to, is to be um, intentional, to have an intention to when and how you use it. So um, just like I recommend for most people, turning alerts off on your phone, especially financial alerts, you want to have a time in your process, a time in your routine where you actually go and proactively use tools like that to understand what's happening. You know, similar to email, right? Uh, it's not great if you check your email every time you get a ding if someone writes you, but if you check it midday around lunchtime and you check it at the end of the day, it's a much better way to do it because then you are you have an intention for how you're using your email and how you're communicating with other people. It's not defined by their needs, it's by yours. So with financial media, I think it's the same way. I have found a lot of times that thoughtful interviews, especially more longer term interviews or long, longer form interviews, I think can be really, really valuable because it, it helps you to reflect and revisit your own um, sort of pre-designed ideas, your own investment approach, and, and hopefully can help you incrementally become a more thoughtful, well-rounded investor. But you have to use it thoughtfully. You have to have an intention. So uh, this is the time midday when I'm going to look at financial media, when I'm going to read articles. Um, instead of reading them real time, I have a way of saving them. I use Pocket and I just pop them in a, in a reader, and then at the end of the day, I go through and I read all those articles that I think, and watch the interviews that I think are gonna be helpful to me. But if you, if you have them pop up real time, you are all of a sudden defining your process based on that input and not on your own well-designed process. So financial media for me can be really, really helpful, but what's most important is you have to define your intention for how you're gonna consume it thoughtfully. So <laughs> using financial media for contrarian uh, inputs, it's a, uh, controversial idea, uh, and I will not mention any of my peers in the industry and their appearances on financial media and what that will often mean, but it is true. When the market is moving up aggressively, they love, you know, in general, you love to have very bullish people telling you why it's going to keep going, and when things get negative very quickly, you will find bearish uh, people quickly pop up on there because the guests and the conversations will reflect the short-term sentiment. So, you know, would I use that as a contrarian input? It certainly, um, it certainly is, a, is a valid point. 
Um, you know, years ago, running the Fidelity chart room, we would look at magazine headlines. Um, and, you know, again, it's a, it's a longer term version of, you know, this is before FNN and, uh, and then CNBC and all those financial uh, networks. The best way you could measure the financial uh, mindset of investors by looking at time and, you know, Newsweek and those sort of periodicals. Um, and so we, you know, years ago, my, my predecessors would look at magazine headlines and, you know, the death of equities happened right before the biggest bull market in U.S. history. And when the market rallied in 99 and 2000, you had, you know, GetRich.com and the New America all talking about technology going to, you know, infinite, you know, infinity levels. Um, so that, you know, I would say financial media is a very short term time compressed version of that contrarian mindset. For me, I would much rather use something that's testable and more systematic and more more disciplined. So for me, something like RSI and measuring the extremes in price movements should lead you to a similar answers. But for me, I like that much more because it's it's something I can test and, and track and follow more thoughtfully. Let's play a game. I'm going to read out three sentences. You have to guess what they have in common. All right, here we go. Sentence number one, this has literally changed my life. I'm currently up enough on this trade to pay off my house. Here's sentence number two. This call has been absolutely spot on. It has made a big difference to my year and portfolio returns. I'm likely up 30% by the end of the year. And sentence number three, it's effectively a macro mentoring program from two of the best. Give up. Each sentence comes from one of our many subscribers to Macro Insiders. That's the actionable macro mentoring service from Ralph Powell and Julian Brigden. To play along yourself, check out Macro Insiders today to see what kind of membership works for you.